My name is George Parsons. I was born in Brooklyn, New York, June 19, 1930. I was raised in Brooklyn my whole life. Uh, I'm the only child. My mother only had one boy, me. And uh, I lived in Brooklyn my whole life. And in, uh, I remember very well uh, the outbreak of the Korea War. I was 19. And uh, a friend of mine had been in the National Guard. And he told me to come up and join the National Guard. That was May of 1950. I went there, and he told me, we, hey, you have a good time, you know, you, you, it, you meet a lot of young men like myself, and uh, uh, you go to camp, uh, to Fort Drum, and you train in the artillery. It was a... a but that was before the Korean War broke out. Right before, mm -hmm. May of 1950. Mm -hmm. Right before, one month before, six weeks, whatever. So I joined in order to meet new friends and, and go to camp and get a little experience. Being one son, I wanted to join the Navy because my father was a commander of the Navy during World War II and in World War I. Oh. So I wanted to join uh, a service, but my mother said, no, I'm the only son, and she didn't want me to go. So I persuaded her to allow me to join the National Guard because you didn't go anywhere, you just went away for two weeks, which was okay. No, that was May of 1950. June of 1950, I'm sure all Koreans remember that. June 25th, 1950, the Korean War broke out. So being a National Guard, we were sent to camp, but we didn't get any leave, no furloughs, no going into town, and we had to stay in a field for two weeks, and it rained every day. We were still in the National Guard. In August 19, 1950, my outfit, the 955th Field Artillery Battalion, was activated into the regular army. We boarded trains and we were sent to Fort Lewis, Washington, uh, all the way on the East Coast, the West Coast. They couldn't send us far enough away from Brooklyn. So they sent us to the other side of the United States. And we trained there from uh, August, and we got a furlough. I got a furlough over New Year's, and I came home, and I went back to Fort Lewis, Washington, around the very beginning of January, uh, the 4th, 5th, or 6th, I'm not sure, but we went on to a, uh, a troop ship, the USS Anderson, and we were sent to uh, Korea. 15 days on this ocean, and How was it? Uh, I was seasick for five days. Five <laughs> how, full days. How many of six soldiers of, were there? There was about 2,500. 2,500. And there was a medical detachment with us of nurses and doctors who we dropped off in Yokohama. And we stood on a ship and they, we went into Pusan. And uh, we landed in Pusan in the end of January. And it was a bit of cold. 1951. 1951. Yeah. And it was cold, bitter cold. And there was no place for us to stay. We had nowhere to go. We just got off the ship and we waited for two days, three days before we had any tents to stay in. We was right in. in uh, so you Busan. stayed in Busan without tent? Yes, we just did. There. Just in the, out in the field? Yeah, out in the field, yes. In that bitter cold? Yeah, bitter winter. cold. We were there standing around. We had a 50 gallon drum that we used to put a fire in, and we all used to stand around the fire, and it was a bit of cold. We finally got our tents at Busan, and then a few days, well, a, month or two, a week or two later, we were put on an LST, and we were sent up to, we landed at Incheon. And at that time, we was assigned to the 5th Regimental Combat Team of the 24th Infantry Division. We landed in uh, Incheon, and we took our howitzers off, and uh, I don't know if anyone knows what an LST is, a very big boat. It opens up in the front yep. and it drops down. And when you're going in, they drop a chain so that they can pull themselves. They pull right into the beach in Incheon. Well, we unloaded, got all our equipment off and went into Incheon. And there was only one bridge remaining at that. There was one bridge in Incheon that we could cross over. And at that time, they were right in the middle of the battle for Seoul. And, uh, they were ready to blow that bridge because they didn't want to have the 
North Koreans and the Chinese come into Incheon, so they, they kept that one bridge. So we got over the bridge, and from there, I don't know where I was. We was in Korea, that's all I could say. We went through Seoul, there was nothing there. It was flattened. Have you heard about Korea before you went? To Never heard of Korea. Never heard of it. I found out it's called the, the Hermit Kingdom. It's called the Land of the Morning Calm. And I never heard of Korea. Mm. I never thought of looking for it. I knew about Japan because of the war we just had finished, but Korea I did not know about. And uh, from that time on, uh, we were back and forth over the 38th parallel. And uh, fighting all the time. And uh, with what our howitzers and uh, uh, it was bitter cold, bitter cold, and uh, we we fought uh, in all the battles, and uh, we went. We finally wound up in the Kumwa Valley. Kumwa, yes. And uh, we, that was part of the Iron Triangle, and that was because of the fact that they they wanted that. Uh, uh, I can't think of the name of the town. There was a small little town, Shawan. Shawan was right in the middle of that. Yep. And we were right in the middle of that iron triangle, and we were back and forth. We were back over the 38th parallel and back and forth. And uh, we took some pictures. And over in, in North Korea, uh, we went to this temple. It was a temple of the kings. And it was a beautiful, beautiful temple. It was all inlaid floors, and the heating system was underneath the floors. And it was a beautiful temple. The ceiling was all uh, colored. Carved, and it, outside was tremendous statues of kings and of animals. Buddha. And uh, there was one area was a great big mound, and we found out later on. I found out that's where they buried like a king or someone who was very important. And uh, we were there, and then we got chased out. And for, unfortunately, uh, a lot of fighting went in around that temple, and uh, it was destroyed. So Who were the main enemy? Uh, at that time, we were, fi we were mostly the, the North Koreans and Chinese. We were supporting the, at that time, we were supporting the, the uh, Sixth Rock, and the 24th Infantry Division was part of us. And uh, the temple was destroyed. And I always thought about that temple. Oh. And, uh, and I never had pictures of it, but a friend of mine did take pictures, and after we got home, I found out about those pictures. When I went back to Korea for my revisit, the first time I went back was in 1998. I went back to Korea and I brought those pictures with me. So uh, we went to the uh, War Museum after we toured all around. So I said, this is the place to find out where this was. So I showed them to uh, the young lady who was our tour guide and she was very helpful, young girl. I don't remember her name. and. Uh, she brought me to the curator of the uh, war museum. War museum. And he kept telling me, no Korea, no Korea. So I said, I know, what do you mean no Korea? I was there. That is Korea. I said, it was in Korea. But what he was telling me was, he wasn't saying it's not Korea. He was saying it was North Korea. Oh. <laughs> so, so I, he was telling me, I'm in Korea. I know I was in Korea. And he said, but unfortunately, I misunderstood what he was saying, but he was trying to tell me that this is North Korea because it's gone. Now, there's no other photos of it or, or any way you could find out. We're, I don't even know where it was. We traveled so much. We were back and forth, fighting all the time, on the line. The line was in back of us, the line was in front of us. We didn't know where we were. And it was just, most of the time, it was just chaotic. We slept, I slept on the ground from January up until maybe the following November. We finally got a tent that we could use, but I had a, uh, a, we had a little tent we used to use, and right in the trails of a howitzer, and they'd be firing all night, we'd be sleeping. And uh, it was uh, an experience that uh, I'll, Never forget. How did that Buddhist temple, how was that Buddhist temple destroyed? Who did well, it? Well, we don't know. It was destroyed between the North Koreans and the Chinese. Uh, maybe we destroyed it when we fired upon it because they took it over. We got chased out. So you, you told me that you always thinking about I it. I always what, thought what about it. What, what is the kind of image and the, the kind of... The image was uh, that it was so beautiful. 
And what do you think about it? How do you think about it? I think about it quite often because I, I can remember being on that beautiful floor and, it, and looking up at that ceiling and going outside and seeing the artifacts, the, the tall stone statues was outside and the camels that was outside. I think they were camels or donkeys was outside, hand carved out of, out of granite, I guess. They were hand carved. And there was one particular one where uh, he must have been a very important man in Korea. He has a uniform on and he's down to here and he has a big sword on his side. And I always thought about that. I always wondered what happened to that temple. And unfortunately, the best I could find out from that curator at the museum was that it was destroyed. And uh, it was a shame. He was a little upset about it, but he never had. So I gave him those pictures. I had copies I gave to him, like I gave some to Daniel. But uh, I often thought about uh, that and a lot of things, you know. Uh, in Korea, uh, Korea was a, a, a battle that it's hard to describe. Uh, it was a battle that we were winning, but nobody wanted to win. They wanted to, put, but we could have went to the right back and, and finished it off, but we didn't do it. And, but I'm thankful for one thing, that the 38th parallel is still preserved. There's still a DMZ, which protects the Korean people, that I helped, not only me, I went to fight for, and that, <clears throat> I'm very proud of that, very proud that when I see the Korean people now, I'm happy that maybe in my small way, I had something to do that gave them back their country and their freedom. That's how I feel about that. And I have a very fondness for the Korean people because they don't forget. They do not forget. This is known as the forgotten war. Why? Uh, well, well, I'll tell you why. When my father came home from World War II and my cousins came home from World War II, there was parades, there was parties, there was block parties. They had their uniforms on and they strutted around like they were very important, which they were. Yeah. I loved all my family. We were very close. We were very close. My mother raised myself, five boys, boys and a girl. That was her brother's family. And their mother passed away. So my uncle, my mother's brother, couldn't take care of them. So my mother took them all in and she raised them. So they were just like my brothers and my sister. Five boys and a girl. And, uh, and, and they came home from the war, who was in Germany, who was in France, who was in Italy. And uh, when I came home, nothing. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. I, Come on my uniform, I, well, did I do something good or, or didn't I? Did I do not as good as them? And that bothered, bothered a lot of Korean war veterans. We kind of buried that, yeah. buried that into, into us. We just put that aside and I said, ah, I'm not going to think about it. And then and around 1990 or so, when this chapter was started, and we started to get involved and do what you, uh, get recognition. I guess that's why it's called the Forgotten War because they just didn't remember. We had no big parades. They gave us a parade and we had a fight to get it. They didn't want us to march down Fifth Avenue. But they said, you can't march down Fifth Avenue. Really? Yes, oh, no, 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 they want that. Oh, want that's that. very So we finally got that. They put a nice memorial to the Universal Soldier. It's over in, in Battery Park. We have a ceremony there every year outside of uh, the Universal Soldier at the start of the war. We usually have it the sadly closest to uh, June 25th. So that's why we feel forgotten. We had to bury our emotions and just didn't, well, I don't know if we were ashamed. I don't know, I don't know, it's a funny feeling. Not to say, hey, you did a good job. Nobody said that. It was just pushed right into the crowd. As soon as I got home, I went to work almost immediately because there was nothing else to do. Mm. And, uh, and then, as I said, in 1990, I think this started to come up, started to come to the top. And I think that uh, uh, 
I joined this outfit, I joined the Korean War veterans, and since then, we've been getting a better feeling about the Korean War. And we, we will not let them forget any longer. I know the Korean people will never let them forget. And we will not let them forget. But someday, there are gonna be no more Korean War veterans. That's why I'm doing this, to remind you that we fought a war that we think was honorable and we saved the country and the people that we feel are honorable and, and they, they respect us for doing that and they honor us for doing that. So we deserve to be recognized. Absolutely. And the Korean people do that. I want you to know that the, this is the only country of all the people, all the nations that the American soldier went to fight for the only country that says thank you. They say thank you. And that's how I feel. I love the Korean people. They're wonderful. They're good to us. And we try to be good to them. We respect them and show them that we did something for them and we're happy to do it. We're not looking to get any credit, just that say thank you, which they do every time you see them. I stand online sometimes. I went to Dunkin' Donuts, my wife and I, I had my Korean War veterans hat on, and I was standing in line, and little bit known to me, there was a Korean gentleman in the back of me. So I ordered my, my order, and when I reached for my wallet, he held my hand, and I said, I didn't know what he wanted. Mm. And he said, this is for me, for the Korean people. So I said, thank you. I said, thank you very much. And he remembered, and any Korean store you go into, there was a lot of Korean stores in Staten Island, the tailors, restaurants. They all say thank you, they bow, and they're very polite. And I love them for that, because they don't forget. 1988 was the Olympics. Yes. It was in Seoul. And I remember sitting watching the Olympics, and Brian Gumbel mm -hmm. was in the back of a great big picture window. And in the back of him was Seoul. And he was, and I was, I said to my wife, that's not Seoul. <laughs> that is not Seoul. And she says, it says Seoul. So I wasn't even looking at him or listening to him. I was looking over his shoulder. And I could not believe the change of Seoul. When I went through it, it was bombed out. The people were in the streets. There was nothing there. I think that the only building that I saw intact at that time when we were going through was the post office board of something like that, one building, and a tall chimney, a tall, smoke, tall smokestack. That's the only thing I remember that was not down to the ground. Not, not. We went through there, we fought our way up to the 38th parallel, past the 38th parallel, back, 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 back. Trench war. Yeah, straight war. They had, they had the Wyoming line, they had the no-name line, they had the New York line. They had the 38 parallel line. So a lot of people say to me, where were you in Korea? I have to say, I don't know. Because I don't know where I was. It was very hectic and we didn't know where we were. I remember Shore One because I have a picture of that town. It's got a sign on a pole and it says Shore One. And I remember the, the, the temple and I remember being in Kumwa Valley because uh, the, the land of the morning mist is true. Because the mist rises from the mountains, and then when the sun comes out, it slowly disappears. And that is a true name for that, the land of the morning mist. It is beautiful. But unfortunately, we were fighting there. So when you saw the changed soul? I was amazed, mm -hmm. absolutely amazed. Where did you go, actually? When you went to oh, I went back in 1998 because they just, they, I took my first opportunity. When I went into Korea, there was that, just that one bridge left, mm -hmm. and that was ready to be blown up. I went back, I, I think they said I have about, I don't know how many, 30 bridges or something across the Han River. I couldn't believe it. I could not believe that it was that way. We had one bridge, we landed in Incheon, got on our equipment, drove up, was going through Seoul, up, back and forth. And I, it just was simply amazing what has happened in Korea. To see it with my eyes mm -hmm. and then see it again, 
It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. The Korean people did a wonderful job. So how would you describe the legacy of Korean War and Korean War veterans? I feel as though the legacy of the Korean War veteran is that he saved the country that was worth saving. He saved the people that was worth saving. And we did the right thing. We went and fought. We, we saved their country and we left and we gave it back to them. It's their country, not ours. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it should be. You go, you save a country, that's what America does. It saves the country and we pull out. We don't stay there and put the people in chains. We free them. And that is, a, to me, uh, a great feeling that I was part of that. And the Korean people, I can't tell you how many, how I feel about that. The Korean people never forget. The Korean Peninsula should be reunited. There's families separated. They should be united. And it might, might give the North Korean people a better life. Absolutely. I don't think they have a good life now. What I see of it on television, I don't think they have a good life. Nothing like South Korea. Mm -hmm. Nothing. And I would gladly hope that that would happen. Reunification of Korea would be wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Do you think the American government has have to support that? No, I think that's an internal affair between the Korean people. <laughs> they should. Their own destiny. They got their own destiny in 1950 to 1953. They got it. Mm -hmm. And they should be the only ones that say, enough is this enough. is done. This yeah. is it. We want to wear one Korea and we should be one Korea, not two Koreas. No. I, I, I don't think the American government or any government has anything to say about that. That's none of their, none of their prerogative. Very good point. Any other comments that you want to leave to the young generations? No, uh, just to remember the Korean War veteran. We fought the best we could. We sacrificed, but we did it willingly. We did it to help the Korean people. Unknown to us at the time how it was going to develop. But the way it turned out, I couldn't ask for any more. So I'm very happy with the end results. It's, a, it's an honor to say I fought in the Korean War and I helped a nation establish itself. And here's the medal. Thank you very much, George. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, young lady.